wonderful. Thank you, Peter. And uh, it has been very um, honored to be here at the BYU and um, to speak to you about my uh, background, my career path, and um, all those experiences that I have since my first degree until now. And so, um, since I'm, I've traveled quite a long way from Hong Kong, you know, 24 hours from the time I, I left Hong Kong until you know arriving to the you know Salt Lake City Airport, and I'm still trying to get myself away from the jet lag. So if I'm not speaking uh, with my mind and try to help me to interpret, and then Peter is going to help and elaborate a <laughs> little bit more. And so. Um, I have been thinking about what are some of the topics that I would like to share with you here because I know that all of you have different backgrounds, you may have different research interests, and you have different agenda, different years in your study, graduate your study. So I'm thinking about um, setting my presentation about all of your future so that you will know where you're going to um, take and then after you graduate and where are you going to go. So these are, have been my questions since my uh, you know, graduate study. And so I've been thinking about these questions myself, so hopefully my experiences can help you to think a little bit more. So my target are the graduate students. So for all those faculty members here, definitely you can um, try to take uh, some of my uh, experiences and see how you can advise to your uh, future graduate students and to help them to uh, find their own path. So. Um, Let's start with a quote from Stephen Hawkins, and everyone knows him. And he said, keeping an active mind has been vital to my survival, as has been uh, maintaining a sense of humor. So I, I want to try to take his um, uh, wisdom and try to find a ways to survive in this very competitive academic world, and also thinking about how to make a very hu humorous uh, life in our, in, our, in our world. So here is one. I, I don't know if it will work, but at least I. I I, I, I will take that, and <laughs> well, I, I'm not there yet, maybe some of you can tell me more about, you know, if you're already somewhere there, and I, I think I'm around here, and so for those who are graduate students, maybe you're, you know, somewhere here, um, so hopefully by the time I get there, and I will still feel something similar to this. so um, I, I will learn more from, uh, you know, senior faculty members, and more about the truth. So, yeah. so, well, I guess your academic uh, life is not that bad. All right, there's still a lot of good hopes and a lot of good things to, to happen in your life um, with your academic pursuit. So, at least this is you know in my own experience. Um, so, these are some of my backgrounds. Yes, I I did uh, quite a few degrees, um, starting off from um, the field of computer science. I was very passionate about that. And I thought I could become a, a you know, computer scientist, and I, I still consider myself a, a, as a computer scientist nowadays, but more interested in education. So we're trying to think about how to make that happen. Yes, and uh, Peter Chen did make a lot of impact on me, and I was his uh, research um, uh, student, and I was uh, his assistant to work on his project on Asian research. And so he, I, I remember one day he was talking about how I could um, you know, have the potential to, to work in the educational field and make impact with my uh, understanding in, in the technologies and how to really help the schools and help the students to learn about that. But still, I try to be persistent and I try to keep my goal because I, I still want to achieve the goal um, to get my uh, um, PhD in computer science, so I did that. So right after I, I finished that and I move on to <laughs> something that I really want to do. So, <laughs> that's, that's the, the truth of the life, right? And so then I, I finished my Master of Education uh, at the University of Illinois, and I was actually thinking about, right, so, that's, that's the end of my presentation, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's go back a little bit. So, and I thought I was, I was trying to get my second doctoral degree in education so that I can equip more myself with the research methodologies and particularly to the you know in the educational field because in computer science we which we tend to solve the problem differently than in education. Um, so I consult a few mentors and few senior colleagues and so they, they they said well you don't have to do that because once you get your PhD you should know how to uh, formulate your research problems and trying to find ways to solve the problem with different methodologies. So you should be intellectually. Um, adequate to, to find ways to solve that by reading more, by consulting others, attending different conferences. So I, I, I took that advice and so I, I still try to 
gain a little bit more knowledge through uh, a formal study. So that's the reason why I, I did that. And because of my own interest, and I also jump into the field of um, law, in IT and IP law, and I know this is a big field, and I know I'm just one step you know, ahead, and, uh, but I, I will talk about why I, I, I take that um, degree and also how I can make an impact in my own uh, teaching as well. So these are some of the um, academic positions I had before I started out at, as an assistant lecturer in uh, Hong Kong uh, Linnan University. So I was teaching uh, in the community college where we have the degrees like the uh, associate degrees and high uh, diploma. Then I, I taught that for a few years. Then I uh, moved to the Education University of Hong Kong, um, former the Hong Kong Institute of Education, which some of you may have heard. And then I spent a few years there and established a very good connection with the local school. So where I um, had a lot of different occasions to conduct professional development for the in-service teachers and I also be the supervisors of um, the uh, practicum students. So there I actually spent a lot of time to make my connections in locally with the schools and also establish a very good interest in, in my own um, area, uh, research agenda. So I spent a lot of time there, uh, wrote quite a few uh, articles and, and then um, now I'm here at Hong Kong. So, these are some of the tasks that I, I've done in the past. Okay. Nothing exciting. But um, so I want to talk to you a little bit more about Hong Kong U so that you know what is Hong Kong U and how it's like, how, how it feels like to be a part of the uh, academic uh, members in, in this university. So, for those, uh, so how many of you have heard about Hong Kong U before I, I came here? Quite a few, and usually the you know, faculty members. Who, so for the rest of the graduate student, you may have never heard about that, because you're here in the US, you heard about Harvard, and MIT, Stanford, um, but not Hong Kong U. But you know, I, Hong Kong U is, is a well-established, uh, prestigious university in Hong Kong, and is one of the oldest universities in Hong Kong, and um, it has a very good uh, ranking in the Asia, and we also make a lot of impacts internationally, and so for those, um, uh, for, for those uh, faculty members who have attend conferences, reading papers, you may come across with a few experts in, in our areas uh, who are from Hong Kong U. And so I would like to show you this video so that for those who have never heard about that, at least you can get a feeling about where I'm working right now. So let's see if the HDMI will work. a Taiwanese student studying social sciences and I live in the residential halls provided at HKU. Um, I've had such an amazing time living in the halls. I've been able to meet a lot of the local students and also international and exchange students and I've made such amazing friends that I believe that I can definitely keep for life. I've also been able to um, participate in a lot of activities such as volleyball. Through volleyball, I've been able to meet a lot of the older students and I've also been able to participate in the inter-hall competitions and through that, I've really been able to really fine-tune my abilities in volleyball and that's been a really great experience for me. I've also really enjoyed the high table dinners. Through these dinners, I've really had the opportunity to have very intellectual and casual conversations with all my whole mates. And I've also been able to understand more about the whole culture and learned a lot from the speakers who are invited to these high table dinners. I've really enjoyed living at the hall and I'm definitely looking forward to the next three years. My name is Lee Kyung Min from Korea, studying Bachelor of Economics and Finance at HKU. I joined HKU campus Toastmasters Club to continue practicing my public speaking skills throughout university. As the club's current president, I work with the executive committee to ensure weekly meetings for all our members. Um, we also conduct joint meetings with other Toastmasters clubs in Hong Kong, interacting with other university students as well as working adults. Community service has always been a very important aspect of my education. So I became part of Speech Express, a non-profit student-run organization that conducts public speaking classes for local secondary school students. As the Chief Finance Officer, um, I have a lot of opportunities for very practical experiences, such as managing the accounts and fundraising initiatives. I love the challenges that come with being involved with extracurricular activities, 
that take my education beyond the traditional classroom. I'm Monica. I'm now in my final year of study as a Bachelor of Science degree with an Environmental Science major. So last summer, I joined a summer program co-organized by the Faculty of Science in HKU as well as the University of British Columbia, UBC. I had such an eye-opening experience throughout that field trip because I get to go on fields every uh, on a daily basis and I get to explore different kinds of habitats that I might not have a chance to see in Hong Kong, such as mud flats, sea grasses beds, rocky shores, etc. And I can also apply those hardcore ecological facts that I learned into some daily issues, such as um, environmental protection issues or some environmental climate change and pollution problems in Hong Kong. Hence, I would greatly, highly recommend HKU students to make the best use of their summer, go on a summer exchange, do a community development program, anything that you're interested in, so that will create the most precious memory in your university life. Hi everyone, my name is Jamil, and I am an international student joining some communications engineering at the University of Hong Kong. Last summer, I had the opportunity to do an internship at J.P. Morgan as a summer intern of investment banking technology under the research publishing team. Our team was actually pretty global. We had people in Hong Kong, in Japan, and the bulk of our team was in Glasgow. Us interns were put into a group of four, myself included, and we were given a case study. We had to talk to traders, identify problems, and come up with a software solution to help them. In fact, towards the end of our internship period, our team of four actually came up with a generic search engine platform. Although we were able to put it into production while we were there, we were told it would go into production very soon, which was pretty cool. My internship was an amazing experience. The people I met, the things I learned, and the experiences I gained made it one of the best summers of my life. So these are some of our students. And two students have passions for their own life. And so as you can see, um, Hong Kong U is a very internationalized uh, institute and we embrace a lot of different uh, international cultures and we welcome different uh, students from different countries and come and learn together and we have a good campus, we have good facilities and we have a lot of different exchanges, uh, also uh, exchange students coming to university every year and to learn together. So um, this is a good place and I, I feel that I'm in the right place to, to teach and do my research. And as you can see my background, I work in three different institutes in Hong Kong. Um, those institutions have so many different um, aspects and commonalities, but they are different in their own missions. So for the one that I worked before in the Education University of Hong Kong, the main mission was trying, it, it is trying to help the local schools and train the, the local teachers. And so most of their research are quite localized. And, but in the Hong Kong U that I'm working with now, they are more internationalized and they want to make uh, more impact uh, out there in the world. So these are some of the backgrounds of um, our universities, and uh, as I said, it's, already, it's, it's ranked number one in Hong Kong, and you know, if you look at the ranking of QS and um, the Times Higher Education, we are ranked pretty, pretty well as well. Um, but these are not important for sure, because uh, these are just for the senior management, so they, they were cheers and they were um, good uh, celebration for that, but for us, we need to think about what are the most important issues that we need to uh, solve in our own research and individually. And so, um, I think all of you are graduate students and you are either a master's student or you're a PhD student here. Um, and I suppose that um, as a graduate student, and, and you must have your own goals and your own objectives to come here to get your graduate degree. So may I ask, so what is your your major purpose to get your graduate degree. What is your career direction? What do you want to do in the future? Let's see if you can. Yes. I think I now think <laughs> uh, that the goal of me being a graduate student was to pursue intellectual freedom, which I guess for me means I get to think about interesting ideas and work on problems that I care about and do that in a way that someone will pay me to do it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so at, at least I'm being paid to, to come here, so it's good. Right? <laughs> so, any others? So what is your perspective? And just to be on my uh, mask, uh, my daily class is connected in Chinese language at your university. Yes. 
Yeah. But uh, the, me the, the medium of instructions at Hong Kong U is in English, and, but if you are in the Department of Chinese and you know, language literatures in Chinese, of course you're, you're taught in, in, in Chinese. But all the programs in Hong Kong that are you know, in the Hong Kong U is in English. Yes? Um, I haven't settled on a specific one, but in general, I've, I've been out and spent some time working as a designer, and I noticed that there were a lot of other conversations happening that I didn't get to participate in at the, at the current level I was at. Um, so, so as things progress, as the educational field develops and incorporates new ideas, I want to be part of those conversations. I really just want to see what's happening. And I assume along I'll, as I as I get there, I'll identify something I'm thinking that I'm more interested in than others. But right now, I just want the opportunity to to, sh to share ideas and talk about it. So, so you are aiming for a master's degree now? I'm in the PhD program. Right now. Okay. I have a master's degree. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Any others? So, what's this? So to my classmates, this will come as no shock. <laughs> but uh, I spent some time working in a low-income, uh, highly segregated school, mm -hmm. and really want to be involved in the education reform conversation here in the United States, especially uh, surrounding the lives of recent immigrant children um, and how to better improve uh, education that has been like historically impoverished. Wonderful. So. Have you ever thought about I don't know, getting your PhD and you will eventually become a professor in university, teaching, research? This is possible, you know, probably uh, one of the major reasons why you are trying to get a PhD. So, um, so you get a PhD probably not because you want to teach in elementary school. I know that some <laughs> elementary school teachers, they are very ambitious to get more degrees for sure, but yes, you know. A few days ago, we were talking about that, and what is the major purpose of getting a doctor of philosophy, and then you practice and you do the teaching. So quite quite often, um, maybe among a lot of different reasons, but you get a PhD because you want to do research and you want to teach in university, you want to find faculty members, uh, or at least um, this is the experience of most of our uh, professors here. So uh, originally, you may you may get you, know, you may think about getting a PhD and work in other institutes and uh, private sectors. But one of the um, the goals for you may be getting a graduate degree and working in university. So I'm I'm taking I'm kind of curious. So um, I look at the websites of UIU um, for jobs and. So once you get your graduate degree, maybe you will finally be qualified to click on that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but before that, you're not permitted to do so. So, 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 yes. so I, I get my PhD degree, so I, I thought, well, yeah, now I, I, I can click on that and see what uh, some of the options I have. So in this morning, I, I did the same thing. So I'm trying to look at what are some of the available jobs here, here at UIU. Um, None of it are from the faculty from the school of education, is that right? So I, I, I tried to search for that, but I couldn't find it. But at least I look at the categories, and I look at you know these different categories in the jobs, and so I did a little um, calculations on that, and only 36.8% are uh, the positions for uh, professorate uh, positions, and others are different um, categories and adjuncts and research faculty, uh, visiting scholars. So what does it mean is, um, so I, I, I learned from Peter Rich and he said that the, the continuous faculty status here is similar to the tenure system out there. So uh, he said that the BYU does not want you to get a tenure, but um, so you can get it. <laughs> so you can get a continuous uh, track. So, so keep you here. So in the other word, it's a more like a permanent contract where you can stay here for uh, a longer time and you don't need to worry too much about the contract and, and then so you can stay here for, for longer time to make a, a longer impact on the research. So for others um, who are applying for adjunct faculty members, that means you're staying here probably for one year and then depends on funding. If funding is allowed, then you can renew your contract. Otherwise, 
who will say a warm um, you know, farewell and hopefully to see you later and so forth. But you, as you can see from the statistic, it's, it's, it's quite consistent with uh, what's happening out there. So I, I also did a little search on uh, this particular article and um, they, they said that uh, there's a lot of, there's a quite a large portion out there in the different uh, universities that they are hiring adjunct faculty members nowadays and it, it becomes more uh, the trend where uh, we do not have the tenure track uh, positions out there. So um, in the other word, that means you may not be able to find a job security in your job. Um, you can you can stay in the non-tenure track for, for a while, but um, that also means that um, you may not be able to get the same uh, benefits or the same uh, privilege as a tenure track professor, where you will not need to worry too much about uh, many other things. So according to the news article, it said that two-thirds of the faculty at U.S. colleges do not tenure or tenure track, but a national decrease in the employment of non-tenure track and temporary teaching faculty known as the gentrifications of university. So hopefully, by seeing this page, um, I hope you're not thinking about, you know, <laughs> discontinuing your, your studies and so forth. <laughs> Charles. So Gary, I'll say that in our field, it's very different from this, I would say. There, yeah. there are a lot more jobs in proportion to graduates than there are, for example, if you get a PhD in English or you get a PhD in, you know, uh, s some other field. Sure. So, I mean, um, we, we have, uh, Bob's been doing some interviewing. How many jobs? Have been posted. I mean, if you were to track the jobs in our if you were to track the jobs in our field that are available this year, how many would you say you've seen? Pre like tenure track jobs. Yeah, it depends on how broad you search. I'm more from a quantitative background, so if you go broad, maybe 30, but related to like my specific interests, maybe 10. Yeah. So far. Yeah. So yeah, thanks Charles. So definitely, we, these are just the average and you know, it depends on different fields. So within education, there's still a lot of different uh, specialization, different fields of research. Some of the research field in education may be much more uh, opportunities than other fields. So, but in general, these are the trends and these are the situation and uh, not surprising because um, I, I see the same situations in Hong Kong, in Asia and in everywhere. And so um, a lot of um, the students are, are thinking about so how are they going to survive and how are they going to find a sustainable future? How to define your research interest and agenda where you can sustain uh, for a longer time. So it will be good that uh, you think about how to finish your dissertation and thesis and find the right topic where your supervisor likes it and then the panel also likes it and sign you off and say now you're ready to graduate. But once you graduate, that's actually the beginning of your, your real life. And so, so how are you going to define your research question where you just um, will, you, know, you, will, you will simply keep working on the same problem and uh, for the rest of your life? I think this is really a good, good uh, thinking. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're done with the dissertation and you're due. So hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll find, try to find uh, clues from that. And once you have your, your well-defined problems, and I don't think you need to worry too much about finding a job, the job will come to you for sure. Um, so yes, it is very difficult to complete your thesis because there's a lot of things you need to do. Every week you have to read a lot of <laughs> literatures, and then you have to talk to your supervisors, and then the supervisor will say, well, these are not the literature you should read. And then you have to spend another whole week at the end and keep reading. And, you know, you may be thinking about how, how about you tell me what are some of the things I should read <laughs> a little bit earlier than than now. So, but, but your supervisor will tend to say, well, how about you keep learning about uh, how to find a good literature to read, right? So, although the your supervisor know how to identify good literature, but this is your own job, your responsibility to learn how to identify good uh, research papers to read and be able to synthesize all of these uh, ideas and then come up with a good. Uh, set of the research questions, and then you can you can continue to uh, work on that. But it's not easy for sure, and it's very challenging. And sometimes 
your supervisor will agree on doing something like this, but you know, later on, you know, the things will continue to evolve, and maybe in a, a week or so, then there's a new papers coming out, and you should read about that, and then you should continue to revise your, your future direction and so forth. So how are we going to overcome all these challenges and be able to, to do that? Um, so according to the article, and also said that uh, about the job security and security, and also mentioned a little bit about that. So in order, in order to get away from this insecurity, and I have gone through these processes, and finally I, I feel that I, I'm able to secure my job. Of course, I'm, I'm still um, um, working on my tenure uh, applications in a few years so since I've already just finished my first year, and this, uh, this is my second year to come. And so um, I still need to think about the same issues, how I can um, uh, how I can define my own uh, research directions and how I can sustain them. According to this article, um, a study about the academic challenges and the American professors in a uh, comparative perspective, and he said that the academic profession faces significant challenges everywhere. So it's not just in the US, but everywhere. But opportunity, opportunities are out there, and I, I'm going to share with you a little bit more about what are some of the available opportunities, not just within the US, but more you know, in the Asia area, in Hong Kong, and then um, you may be able to consider to get out of you know, maybe some of your comfort zone and trying to um, find an international um, experiences in your career. So uh, because of all these challenges and um, a lot of uh, question in my mind, and I, so these are some of the things I did and um, trying to think about how to position myself, how I can um, look for my research directions, and also uh, applying to the teaching. And sometimes we think about teaching and research are two different areas, but as a professor, uh, these two are actually integrated into one. Uh, particularly in our own area in educational research, uh, quite often I do uh, educational research in my own classroom as well, trying to test uh, some ideas in my own teaching and um, try to use my um, students as a can you think? Right. <laughs> so, but, but they're happy about that. So, um, but, but yes, we, we work together. So, and I grew up in, in, the, in the computer science background. Um, it's not that easy to transition myself from the computer science background and uh, working on the technical part of the research and jump into the uh, more social science aspect of educational research. Um, my previous research was uh, mainly in wireless communication, wireless, wireless networking, and uh, working on optimizations of um, different routing systems and how to um, uh, solve these issues with different mathematical modelings and so forth. So it's quite different thinking about how to conduct the research in teaching and learning. But I look at my own interests, and I, I, I have a strong background in the technical part of the computer science, and I'm also interested in education. So I was thinking about, could I combine all these uh, knowledge together and solve some of the research problems? And so um, computer science education has been one of my, uh, my interests, and I was thinking about finding a position in the Department of Computer Science to work on this issue. But honestly, uh, in, in the reality, you won't be able to find too many um, institutes where they have a computer science department, where they have an interest in working on educational issues. Not too many. And so, I was thinking, well, how about I look to the educational education faculty, School of Education, to see whether I can find a good spot and to establish my research team and my research work. So I did, and I did that, and I was able to do that. And so from that point, I continued to develop a very clear transdisciplinary research agenda and thinking about these issues together, not just thinking from the educational perspective, but, but also thinking about the technical side and how are we going to implement all these um, good ideas and so forth. Um, so many of you uh, may be facing finding a job in, in, uh, 
in university, become a professor, and some of the things that you may be thinking about is the publications and research funding. So which one will come first? Should we you know, <laughs> publish and then get the funding, or should we get the funding so that we can have more publication? So these are some of the things that we have been arguing, and, and sometimes we have been thinking about without resource funding, and how could we generate a good publication because of the scales? And, and so definitely, we can go, go into the field and collect the data with ourselves, but if we want to make a bigger impact and to do more, you need to have resource funding to, to help you do that. But sometimes when you apply for the competitive resource funding, um, you need to show them a very good track record in that area. So there's a lot of these kind of questions, a lot of dilemma, and which one we should go first. And uh, definitely I can, I can tell you more about my experiences um, in a few minutes. So. But first of all, what is uh, transdisciplinary research? So I, according to um, uh, Harvard University and School of Public Health, they, um, they define the transdisciplinary research is defined as research effort conducted by investigators, investigators from different disciplines. So working together, trying to create new concepts, and trying to solve the same problems together. So I, I, I was looking at that, and I thought, I find that, well, yes, and it seems very interesting that uh, I can go into that because I have different backgrounds. I have my background in computer science, and I have my background in education, and you know I, I can do the transdisciplinary research myself. Of course, this is not a good idea, but this is a good start. Um, quite often, um, different researchers, they, from, they are from different fields, but they speak different languages. So therefore, they may not be able to collaborate easily because they, they stand on their own point. They say, well, this is the way that we do the, the research, and the other will say, well, this is not quite effective. And I, I remember recently uh, I, I attended a conference in, in uh, learning analytics and data science, and this is one of the hot topics in, in education. And so in these kind of conferences, you will, en will encounter different researchers in the same conference. You will have researchers from computer science working on the uh, algorithms of, of the design, and the, we have another set of the researchers who are more interested in the educational, you know, from the educational perspective. So I remember in one session, um, the presenter uh, who are from the, uh, I, I don't remember uh, which department they're from, but the pre presenter was presenting a way to analyze those uh, big data and try to find the, uh, the learning performance of the students. And so one audience, stood up and then to, to say, well, these are the algorithms that we have been using for many years. And so why don't you think about other more advanced algorithms? So, so as you can see, different researchers from different perspectives, sometimes it's quite difficult to, to work on the problems together. But this is actually the trend. And we also realize that in order to come up with a better solution, we cannot just stand in our own on ground and we have to work across our comfort zone and beyond our disciplinary approach. So therefore, transdisciplinary research becomes one of the trends, at least in my own area, uh, from what I see. So because of that, I, um, <clears throat> I find... Gary? Yes, Charles. Can I just ask, why do they call it, why do they call it transdition, transdisciplinary instead of interdisciplinary? Well, yeah. interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary, they are actually um, different approaches to problems. So if you're thinking about transdisciplinary approach, that means you are trying to think about the knowledge that you have in one discipline and trying to transit or trying to make an impact in other disciplines. So maybe you are solving a um, uh, medical uh, research problem, but maybe you are standing from the point of um, technical backgrounds and so how to make use of these technologies and to integrate into the medical research. So these are more like a transdisciplinary research. Um, in contrast to the interdisciplinary research, we are working properly on a similar level and thinking about the problem itself is uh, interdisciplinary uh, by nature. So it's a little bit different, but they, of course they have some overlaps in between for sure, because we're still in the essentially think about having different knowledge to you know, work together and combine it and then to solve the problems. Yeah. But very similar for sure. Yeah. Any other view on that? But we can talk more about that for sure. So that's how I position myself in my own research agenda. 
And as I said, I'm quite interested in, in uh, computer science and how to make the impact in education. And recently, computational thinking has been one of the hottest topic in, in the areas. So a lot of different schools and thinking about how to bring programming back to the school, although we've seen that uh, you know, in the 80s when Seymour Parker from MIT developed the local programming and tried to do the same things back then. And um, so it wasn't a good successful um, situation because with many different reasons. But nowadays we have new tools with the new technology become more mature and so we can bring back into um, schools and see how we can make the impact. And I'm also interested in computer media reality in education and um, virtual reality, augmented realities are also some of the new technologies that can be used and applied in education and so forth. And also integrated STEM education, um, which take the, um, the natures of transdiscipl transdisciplinary approach and solve the problems. And hopefully, we can help the students in the elementary school, primary school age and be able to think about the problems uh, from different angles. So that's how I, I do that. And I am quite interested in the center of page of six. And I also established a very well um, grant uh, applications with the grants that I have. Um, very grateful to do my research and also uh, in the past, um, since I graduated uh, 2012 with my PhD until now, I'm able to uh, publish 60 uh, publications, um, of course with other uh, scholars for sure. So recently, I am working on these two big projects. Um, projects that I have uh, with the Research Grant Council in Hong Kong under the scheme of General Research Fund is similar to the National Science Foundation in the U.S. As, as you know, it's very competitive to get an NSF fund, and once you get that, it's like, you know, you can get a lottery and, and very, very good uh, reputations to, to, to get the funds to support the research. So I, with the funding, I'm working on the impact of coding education in Hong Kong primary schools and longitudinal study for three years and trying to find out how the students in the upper levels of the elementary school starting from grade four uh, working on the um, you know, coding and com computational thinking and over the three years and whether they will make some changes in the ways that they solve the problems and the way that they learn. And also another project I'm working on is um, entitled Enhancing Language Education with Artificial Reality New Platform called eLearn. And this funding uh, funded by the government allows us to build a project team to uh, develop a new platform for the students in Hong Kong in primary school to learn language. So virtual reality originally developed as a technology not sure for what purpose, but you know, at the very beginning, they, they may be thinking about gaming and then entertainment and so forth. But it has a lot of good potential to impact into different areas. And I, and I, and I look at a lot of different literatures, and they haven't really looked into how this technology may be able to, to, to change the way that we learn languages. So um, therefore, I try to combine it together and create a, a proposal. And, um, and I discussed with the government, and then I, I was able to, to get the funding with uh, 18 schools in Hong Kong uh, all together to come up with this project. And so for this particular one, uh, I can share a little bit more about the details, but not on the real details, because today my purpose is not trying to talk about the research methods and also the ways that you uh, conduct this research, but I'm trying to help you to, to see um, how I think about a problem from different angles and come up with a successful uh, research project. And as I said, this is a three-year longitudinal study from grade four to grade six, and I have started last year and we finished um, the, the first year already, and we are on, on the uh, second year. And I have these objectives, trying to understand the impact of computational thinking on children's learning and problem-solving skills, and also trying to understand the challenges and also think about how sustainable it may be. And uh, last year, we were so um, blessed to have uh, Professor Kafai, and who has been a very famous um, in the area of computational thinking, and she came to Hong Kong View and also did a seminars and did a workshop with us. And uh, we learned a lot about uh, from her uh, perspective and how we can improve the uh, computational thinking research here in Hong Kong. And 
So these are some of the pictures I took from the um, from the observations that I had, and as you can see, these are the students in Hong Kong, and we are working with six schools, six public schools in Hong Kong, uh, on this project. And we developed our own curriculum, and we also developed our, our own assessment for that. And one of the challenges that we faced was um, we want to do the um, study in the formal curriculum, because a lot of these uh, studies out there, they were thinking about, yes, coding is interesting, programming is fun, and then we put it in the out of school um, uh, curriculum. So after class, you can, you can have special groups to learn about that, but um, how to integrate into the formal curriculum and how much time we should dedicate for this it is a real, real, uh, real question to ask. So we, we try to do that and we only set aside six hours. We told the school that maybe we just need to have six hours and learn a little bit rather than having a full year um, for so many weeks. So we only spend uh, six hours in the whole academic year for, for that purpose. So these are some of the uh, pictures, students and the teachers uh, working on that. And also for this particular lesson, they were playing with um, this, what we call the, the, the bus, the bit. Uh, you know, it's a more like a um, other activities where they will um, manipulate with these card games and by using different instructions to play that. And I, I think this uh, particular activity, this uh, game, is from the UK. So we, we thought it might be interesting to do that. And so we, we brought that uh, into the class. And so these are some of the, the um, situations in the class. They work together. And we try to give them the um, environments where the student can work together under the collaborative problem solving approach, where not uh, one computer per student, but hopefully in a group of the students, they work on the problems together and so forth. So um, that's one example, and also this is an example that I use a VR to help the students to learn languages in primary schools. So originally, we were thinking about, yes, virtual reality is, is quite interesting, where we can allow the students to have uh, the immersive experiences um, in the situation. And we thought about, well, we could not always bring the students abroad to everywhere. And of course, this would be good if we can do that every day, every week, and to allow students to have the experiences everywhere, but possibly not, not uh, feasible. So virtual reality will allow us to let the students to explore different scenes, different settings, and then through that, hopefully the students will gain more experiences about different uh, environments. And then when they come back to the reality, they can learn how to express themselves based on these situ different situations. So that's... Um, some of the things that we have done. So because of the time, and I would definitely want to open to the floor so that you can ask more questions and something that you may be interested to, to learn more. Um, so these are some of the tips, if you might uh, take that um, away from, from these seminars um, to help you to survive your graduate study and also think about how you can plan ahead for your future career. So at least these are some of, the, my, some of my experiences and some of the tips that works for me. And so I think it would be good as a graduate student to develop a, very, a stronger research interest in, with your own passion and work on the prom, problems that you, you really like, work on the issues that you have passion about and try to make impact on that. But not just thinking about your own disciplined uh, approach, but try to take the approaches from different disciplines and try to integrate all together to, to solve the problems. Um, some of the at least my experience, sometimes I was thinking about solving problems locally and I was thinking about maybe uh, the classroom might see the issues so I, I was trying to find a way to solve that issue. But trying to think out of the box, trying to solve the problems that are inches internationally, not just the, the inches within your own community. So if you want to make bigger impact, you, if, you're able, you, if you want to submit your, your papers to uh, high impact journals, definitely you want to attract um, uh, the international scholars to be interested in your work and be able to generalize your results elsewhere as much as possible. And another one, another important part um, in your research is think about your theoretical orientation. Think about what are some of the theories behind what you do rather than, well, I have a good idea and I think this is the way to solve. But does it fit into any theoretical frameworks? Does it um, 
Um, can it be answered by any theories about what you do your design and so forth? The last, uh, last but not least, and I think um, you need to be, you, know, you, need, you need to be faithful in the gospel and be able to understand that um, knowledge can be beyond what you see. And um, at least from my own experience, um, I'm able to be inspired and to think about how to solve the problems um, in my own areas uh, with the gospel's uh, perspective that I have. So hopefully, and from today on, and you will be able to uh, identify your interesting problems to solve and your supervisor will like it. And also once you graduate, then you will be able to attract uh, more opportunities with your uh, experiences and your knowledge. So thank you very much.